Hey class, my name is Andrew Dudley. I am one of your undergraduate TAs, and today I'll be going over the CSC 340 final exam that I took last semester. This exam goes over regular expressions, first and follow sets, static and dynamic scoping, box circle diagrams, and Hindley-Milner type inference. There are two other problems at the end of this exam that will be covered by a different undergraduate TA, and that's on pass by value reference and name, as well as lambda calculus. Let's go ahead and get started. First, we are given a set of regular expressions, as well as a set of strings, and we are asked if the string occurs inside of the language of that regular expression. So, for the language of alpha, we see that little a can be matched by letter star, and digit or capital letter can match the capital D. And then we have letter star afterwards. And unfortunately, letter star will not match the next zero in the string. So this string is not an element in this language. Next, we look at the language of row. Rho can accept zero or more digits, so we know that can match 3300, zero, zero, followed by zero or more capital letters. So if letter star matches the empty string, then we see that Rho is in fact, or that this string is in fact in the language of Rho. Next, we have the same string, but for the language of Phi. Phi takes in a digit followed by another digit followed by zero or more lowercase letters. Well, it'll match the first two digits, three, three. However, letter star will not match the zeros that follow. So this string is not in the language of phi. And finally, we have the language of omega. And omega accepts zero or more capital letters. So we know A will match to letter star. Then we need either a letter or zero or more digits. So digit star will match the zero, zero here. However, then we are at the end of the regular expression, so it won't match this entire string, indicating that this string is also not an element in the language of omega. Next, we're asked to find the sequence of tokens that will be returned if we call get token on this string here. Now, there's a quick way to do this for small examples like this, but for the sake of this demonstration, I'm going to show you the long way so you understand what happens at each step. So, we're going to start out by making a table And in the first column, I'm going to put the longest match that we've found so far. And in the second column, I'm going to put the potential regular expressions or languages. And we know that when we start out, all of these tokens could potentially be a match, so I'm going to skip that row and just imagine that we have a row here that says all. Instead, I'm going to start out by moving the cursor over to the first character in the string, and now we're going to go through each one of these regular expressions and find out which one matches or could potentially match this string. We know lowercase letter will not match zero, and capital letter will not match zero. However, digit does match. So we will put digit here with a length of one. Now we know that if any of these other regular expressions do match the string zero, digit's going to take precedence because it comes first. So we'll only put them in potential, and we'll only put them in potential if that's the end of the regular expression. 
So moving on, we'll take a look at alpha. We see that letters star can match the empty string. Then for digit or letter, we can have this digit match zero. And then capital letter star can also match the empty string, indicating that alpha is a match and it's also a potential match because we know that if we were to get a capital letter later on, alpha may still match the string. So we're going to put alpha in this row. Next, we'll take a look at row. Row takes zero or more digits followed by zero or more capital letters. So digit star can match zero and then letter star can match the empty string indicating that row is also a potential match. Next up we have phi. Phi matches a digit followed by another digit followed by letter star. So this first digit indicates that we could have a potential match with phi. And finally we have omega which matches capital letter star followed by either a letter or zero or more digits. So if letter star matches the empty string and we use digit star here to match the zero, we see that omega is also a uh, potential match. And again, several of these are also uh, current matches for just the string zero a digit will take precedence over them because it comes earlier in the list. However, because these we weren't at the ends of these regular expressions or they use a clean star, we know that as we go further down this string, they may still in fact be longer matches. So let's go ahead and copy our string down again. 00 A capital D A 3D and we'll move the cursor over one. So now we're looking at the string zero, zero. And instead of looking through all of the regular expressions, we're just going to look at the ones that could be the tokens in the potential column. So we'll take a look at alpha. Alpha matches zero or more letters, followed by a single digit that we have here, followed by zero or more capital letters. Unfortunately, this will not match the second zero in our string, so alpha is no longer a potential match. Then row can match zero or more digits, so this can match both zeros, followed by zero or more capital letters, so this can match just the empty string. And we see that row is now the longest match with a length of two. Moving on to phi, we Phi will match a digit followed by another digit, so that'll match the first zero and then the second zero, followed by zero or more letters, so phi is still a potential match. And then for omega, we have zero or more letters, followed by letter and then zero or more digits. Well, if letter star matches the empty string, then digit star here will match the two zeros and omega is still a potential match. Next, we'll move the cursor over one. Now we're looking at the string zero, zero, A. If we take a look at phi, we see that phi will match a digit followed by another digit followed by zero or more lowercase letters, which is in fact exactly what we have. A digit, another digit, and then a lowercase letter. So now phi is our longest match of length three. And looking at omega, if letter star matches the empty string, then we can take digit star here to match the first two zeros. However, that will not match the lowercase a. So omega is no longer a potential match. Next, we'd want to run this one more time because omega here is actually still a potential match as well. We haven't necessarily reached the end of the regular expression. So we'll copy the string down. 
we'll move the cursor over one and then when we look at phi we'll see that it matches digit digit followed by zero or more letters well that will not match this capital D that we have here and we no longer have anything left in our potential column so we'll move the cursor back one and we'll write down that phi was our longest match of length 3. Make sure you don't forget to move the cursor back. So now we are left with this string DA3D. And we'll start the process over. Moving the cursor over to the first letter, we have capital D, which lowercase letter will not match but capital letter matches so we have our longest match so far digit will not match alpha has zero or more lowercase letters followed by a digit or a letter so alpha is a potential match Row matches zero or more digits, followed by zero or more capital letters. So if digit star matches the empty string, then letter capital letter star will match the capital D. For phi, phi requires a digit followed by another digit, followed by zero or more letters. And unfortunately, f this first digit will not match the capital D, so phi is not a potential match. And omega starts out by matching zero or more capital letters, so omega is a potential match. Next, we'll move the cursor over one. And we'll look at the regular expressions that we have in our potential list. Starting with alpha, if letter star matches the empty string, and then we take the OR to mean this letter, followed by zero or more capital letters. We see that the lowercase a will not be matched by this string alpha, so alpha is no longer a potential match. Next up we have rho, which matches zero or more digits, followed by zero or more capital letters. so rho will not match either. And finally we have omega which matches zero or more capital letters so this can match the capital D followed by a letter or zero or more digits so this letter will match the lowercase a and we are left with a new longest here with omega of length 2. And because we took letter here, we are in fact at the end of the regular expression. So we can stop here and we know that omega is the longest token that we can get. So we will start over once more. We'll copy the rest of our string down here as 3D. And first looking at just the 3 we see that digit will match that, so digit is our longest match of length 1. For alpha star, or I'm sorry, for alpha, if letter star is the empty string, then the digit 3 can be matched by this. So alpha is a potential match. And then we have rho, which matches zero or more digits at the start, so rho is a potential match. And finally, we have omega, which is letter star followed by a letter or zero or more digits. So if letter star matches the empty string and we take the digit star option, then the three will be matched by digit star. And therefore, omega is also a potential match. Finally, we'll move the cursor over again. And now we'll take a look at alpha. Alpha matches the empty string with letter star. It matches the three with digit. 
and then it matches the capital D with capital letter star. So we see that alpha is in fact a match of length 2. And because we're at the end of our string and we have a match, uh, we don't have to continue any further. We know that alpha will match this token. And for our final answer, the sequence of tokens that is returned, if we call get token on this string, will be phi omega alpha. Moving on to the next problem, we have first and follow sets. So for this, I'll show you guys the rules on the side here. And as you know, when we're calculating first sets, we're going to want to create a table for every non-terminal. And for each of those non-terminals, we are going to initialize an empty, an empty set. So we'll have the first of s, equals the empty set, etc. Now that we have the start of our table, we will calculate the first set for each of our non-terminals. And as stated on the side here in the rules, we have initialized the first sets as empty. So starting with S, we'll see that in rule 3, we'll take the first symbol of our non-terminal s, and we will add the first set of that symbol minus epsilon to the first of s. So s has s goes to a c as the rule, so we will add the first of a minus epsilon to the first of s. And when we look for the first of a, we aren't trying to calculate it up here, we're using our initialized sets down here. So the first of a minus epsilon is currently just the empty set. For our next rule for s, we see s goes to bd, so we will add the first of b minus epsilon to the first of s, and the first of b is also currently the empty set. And that's the last rule that we have for the non-terminal s. So we'll close this off and move on to a. So for the first rule of a, we see that a goes to bbc. So we will add the first of b to the first of a, and the first of b is currently the empty set. Next, we see the rule a goes to epsilon. So, using rule 3, we'll add the first of, I'm sorry, well, we'll actually use rule 2 and say that the first of epsilon equals the set containing epsilon. So, we will add epsilon to the first of A. And then for the first of B, we see that in the first rule for B, we have little b c and using rule 1 we see that th the first of x equals the set containing x if x is a terminal so in this case little b is a terminal so we will add the set containing b to the first of b And then for the next rule of b, we see that b goes to b. And you'll notice this rule doesn't actually do anything. It's a circular loop. It doesn't add any characters to the string being generated. So what we can actually do to help simplify this for us is simply uh, scratch this rule out. And that is the last rule that we have for the non-terminal b. Now I'm going to put an asterisk next to this. And the reason for that is, if we take a look at now the one rule that we have for b, it starts out with a terminal. So anytime we go through this rule, we're going to hit this terminal, we're going to add it to our set, 
and then we're going to be done. So B can never have any more characters added to the set for the first of B. Doing this will help prevent us from recalculating first sets that we've already completed. Next up we have the non-terminal C. So we see that C goes to C little c. So first we will use rule 3 and we will add the first of C minus epsilon to the first of C. And the first of C is currently the empty set. Next we'll look at the second rule for C which says that C goes to epsilon. So using I believe rule 3 and then rule 2 we'll end up with the first of epsilon is the set containing epsilon so we will add that to our first of C. Finally we have the non-terminal D so to calculate the first of D we'll look at its first rule. We see that D goes to capital A so we will add the first of A minus epsilon to D and the first of A is currently the set containing epsilon so that minus epsilon is just the empty set and then if we take a look over here at rule 4 we'll see that if a rule contains epsilon then we'll move on to the next symbol in that rule and calculate that as well so now we'll take a look at the we'll add the first of little a minus epsilon to D and the first of little a as per rule 1 says that the first of little a is the set containing little a so we will add that here and then for our second rule for D here we see that D goes to little d so again using rule 1 we will add D to our first set Now that we've gone through our, all of the first sets for the non-terminals, we are going to continue this process. And we will keep continuing this process until these first sets don't change through an entire iteration. So starting again with the first of S, we'll say that we'll add the first of A minus epsilon to the first of S. The first of A is currently the set containing epsilon, so that matches the uh, empty set. And using rule 4, because the first of A contained epsilon, we'll move on to the next symbol, and we, that next symbol here is C. So we'll add the first of C minus epsilon to the first of S. The first of C is currently just the set containing epsilon. So if we subtract epsilon from that set, we are returned uh, an empty set again. Once again, we'll use rule 4, and because the first of C contained epsilon, we'll move on to the next character. However, there is no next symbol. So if we take a look down here at rule 5, it says that if all of the symbols following our current rule, or if the first sets of all of those symbols contain the element epsilon, then we will add epsilon to the first of our current non-terminal. So we are currently looking at the non-terminal S, so we will add epsilon to the first of S. For the next rule of S, we see that S goes to BD. So if we're using rule 3, we will add the first of B minus epsilon to the first of S. The first of B is the set containing B, so we will add B to the first of S. Moving on to A, we see A goes to BBC. So using rule 3, we will add the first of B minus epsilon to the first of A. The first of B is currently the set containing little b, so we will add B to the first of A. 
For the next rule of a, we see that a, of course, goes to epsilon, and using rule 2, we will add epsilon to the first of a. b, we see, has an asterisk over it, which means that this set is already complete and won't change again, so we can simply copy the set containing b over. Now for the first of c, we see that c goes to c little c. So we'll add the first of c minus epsilon to the first of c. The first of c is currently just the set containing epsilon. So we will move on using rule 4 to the next symbol. And using rule 1, we will add the first of little c to the first of c. For the second rule for c, we see again that c goes to epsilon, so we will add epsilon to our first set. Now again, you'll notice that c goes to c little c, and this c can only possibly match either this epsilon or this terminal c here which means that we now know that just like with the first of b set here, the first of c will no longer change. We won't have any other characters added to this set. So I will put an asterisk next to it. Moving on to the first of d, we see that d goes to a, so we will add the first of a minus epsilon to the first of d. The first of A is the set containing B and Epsilon, so we will add B. And using rule 4, because the first of A contains Epsilon, we'll move on to the next symbol. And the next symbol is the terminal A, so using rule 1, we will add that little a to our first of D. And then we'll move on to the next rule for d, which just says that d goes to little d, and we will add that little d to our set. Now, because the first sets of our non-terminals, or at least one of them, has changed from the first set of our previous iteration, we will iterate through again. So for s, s goes to a, we will add the first of a minus epsilon to s, first of a is currently the set containing b epsilon, so we will add b. Using rule 4, because the first of a contains epsilon, we'll move on to the symbol c, and we will add the first of c minus epsilon to the first of s. The first of c is currently the set containing c and epsilon, so we will add c. And because the first of C contained epsilon, we will use rule 4, uh, and actually in this case rule 5, because C was the last symbol of that rule for S. Um, we know that both the A and the C contained the symbol epsilon, so by rule 5 we will again add epsilon to the first of S. Next, for A, we see A goes to BBC, so we add the first of B minus epsilon to A, to the first of A. The first of B is the set containing B. Then we'll move on to the second rule for A, which is that A goes to epsilon, and we will add epsilon again. First of B we know is already complete. And first of C, we also know, is already complete. So, moving on to the first of D, we see D goes to A, so we will add the first of A minus epsilon. First of A is B epsilon, so we will add B. By rule 4, because the first of A contains epsilon, we'll move on to the next symbol, which is little a. Using rule 1, uh, we will add the first of A 
to the first of D, or I'm sorry, the first of little a. And for the second rule of D, we see D goes to little d, so we will add little d to our set. Notice here that the set for the first of S changed from our prior iteration to this one, so we have to run the iteration again. We're going to run through it quickly this time. We see that S goes to big A, so we will add the first of A minus epsilon to the first of S, which is B, because the first of A contains epsilon. We will then add the first of C minus epsilon to the first of S. First of C is C epsilon, so we add C. And because both A and C contained, the first of both A and the first of C contained epsilon, we'll add epsilon to S. For the first of A, we see that A goes to B, so we will add the first of B minus epsilon. The first of B is the set containing B. And for the second rule of A, we see A goes to epsilon, so using rule 2, we will add epsilon to our set. We know that the first of B is already complete, and we know that the first of C is already complete. And now for the first of D, we see that D goes to A, so we add the first of A minus epsilon, which will give us B. Using rule 4, we move on to little a. The first of little a is the set containing a little a, so we add that. And for the last rule of d, we see d goes to little d. Using rule 1, we will add d to our set. Now you'll notice that our prior iteration and our current iteration didn't change the set, or our current iteration didn't change the set from our prior iteration. So we know that we are done, and these are our first sets. Are you having fun yet? I hope so, because that's not the end of the problem. Now that we have our first sets, we have to find the follow sets. And the rule for follow sets is also here on the right side. So once again, we will initialize our follow sets as being empty. Now we know that the first set of a non-terminal is a set of all of the characters that can occur as the first symbol when we use that non-terminal. Similarly, the follow sets for a non-terminal will be all of the possible characters that could follow that non-terminal. But the way that we calculate these is going to be a bit different from how we calculated the first sets. First, notice in our first rule over here, that for follow sets, we're going to take the non-terminal that is our starting symbol, and we are going to add end of to the follow of that starting symbol right off the bat. And I don't know if this is how you guys were taught it, but when I took the course, we represented end of with the dollar sign. So I'm going to do the same here. Now when calculating follow sets, instead of looking for the left-hand side that contains the current symbol, we're going to look for our current symbol on the right-hand side of any of our rules. So we'll notice that for S, S doesn't occur on the right-hand side anywhere. However, if it did, even though it is our starting symbol, we would still have to go through and use the rules from the rest of our steps. Because it doesn't occur on the right-hand side, we can simply close off our follow set. And because it's not going to magically appear on the right-hand side while we're calculating this, I'll put an asterisk next to this, indicating that the follow of S will not change. Now we'll move on to A. And I should warn you guys that the rules for the follow sets are kind of inverted from the... Uh, order that I would think they would intuitively be in, so I might mix them up as I run through this. Uh, but we'll go ahead and start. So for the follow of A, we're going to find all of the places that A occurs on the right-hand side of a rule. 
So we see A occurs in the first rule of S. So following rule 4 here, where in this case this B represents our A, we are going to add the first of A1, which in our case is C, minus epsilon to the follow of our current symbol, A. So we are going to add the first of C minus epsilon to the follow of A. Let's take a look here. We have our firsts calculated. In amazing handwriting, I know. So the first of C is the set containing C epsilon. So we will add that set minus epsilon to the follow of A. Similar to when calculating the first sets, because the first of C contained epsilon, we're going to use rule 5 here to say that we'll then add the first of the next symbol to the minus epsilon to the follow of A. However, C is the last symbol in the list. And rule 3 says that if all of these, if the first sets of all of the symbols following our current symbol contain epsilon, then we are going to add the follow of the rule that we're looking at to the follow of our current symbol. In our case, because both, or because C contained epsilon, we are going to add the follow of S to the follow of A. And the follow of S is the end of symbol. Now remember that we have to do this for every instance that A occurs on the right hand side. So we'll find another A down here in the first rule for D. And using this A and rule 4, we are going to add the first of little a minus epsilon to the follow of A. Using rule 1 from the first rules, the first of little a is little a, and so we will add that to the follow of A. And that is the last occurrence of A on the right-hand side, so we will move on to B. We see that B occurs in the second rule of S here. So, using rule 4, we will add the first of D minus epsilon to the follow of B. The first of D is BAD, so we will add that to the follow of B. And then we will move on to the next occurrence of B on the right-hand side, which is in the first rule of A. Using rule 4, we are going to add the first of B minus epsilon to the follow of B. And we calculated the first of B to be the set containing little b. So we will add a little b to the follow of b, and it's already there. So of course, when we union two sets and they contain the same symbol, that symbol just stays the same. Next, we have another occurrence of b in the same rule here. So for this one, we will use rule 4 to add the first of c minus epsilon to the follow of b. The first of C is C epsilon, so we will add little c to the follow of B. And for the B that we're looking at here, we see that by rule, uh, let's see which rule is it here. Do, 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 do. For rule 3, because every symbol that follows our current non-terminal B, the first of that symbol contains epsilon, 
we are going to add the follow of A to the follow of B. And the follow of A is C dollar sign A. So C and A are already in the set. We will add the end of symbol. For the follow of D, we'll find the only occurrence of D here on the right hand side. And we see that D is the last symbol in the rule. And we have a specific follow set rule for this. We see that if our symbol is the last symbol in the rule, then we will add the follow of that rule to the follow of our current non-terminal. Again, in our case, that means that we are adding the follow of S to the follow of D. And the follow of S, and actually, huh, I'm sorry, it looks like I skipped over one thing here, something important. I jumped down to D. We need to go back and do this for C. So let's do that really quick. We see that C also occurs as the last symbol of rule A. So using that rule 2, we will add the follow of A to the follow of C. Next, we also see that C occurs as the last symbol of rule S. So we will add the follow of S to the follow of C, and we already have that dollar sign in there. C is also the last symbol of rule B. Again, with rule 2, we add the follow of B to the follow of C. Now you'll notice that every non-terminal symbol plus the dollar sign symbol that we have here, every possible one that we could add to this set is already there. So technically we can stop here, but we'll just go ahead and look for the last occurrence of C in the rule of C. Uh, we'll notice that it's here on the right hand side, so we will add the first of little c minus epsilon to the follow of C. And of course, C is already in the follow of C. So for rule D, we've already said that rule D occurs in this rule for S, and it's the last symbol. So using rule 2, we will add the follow of S to the follow of D. And that is the only place that D occurs on the right-hand side, so we know that we are done. And because that rule that it occurs in is also already complete, as uh, noted by this asterisk here. We can also technically put an asterisk next to this as well, indicating that that set will not change going forward. Now, at least one of our first sets has changed from the prior iteration, so we will run through this again. We know that the follow of S is already a complete set. So we'll find A in this rule, and we will add the follow of C minus epsilon, or I'm sorry, the first of C minus epsilon to the follow of A. The first of C minus epsilon is C. And because C was the last symbol, and the first of C contained epsilon, we will use our rule down here to add the follow of S to the follow of A. A also occurs on the right-hand side in this rule of D, so we will add the first of little a minus epsilon to the follow of A, and that will give us A. For the follow of B, we see that B occurs in this rule by S, so we will add the first of D minus epsilon to the follow of B. First of D is BAD. B, 
and you'll notice here actually that because the first of B the follow of B already contains every possible symbol that no other symbols could all could possibly be added to this so instead of running through this for every occurrence of B we're just going to copy those symbols down and mark it with an asterisk if we were to continue this for the follow of B and locate all of the B's and go through our follow sets uh, it should be apparent that nothing will change the same thing here for the follow of C the, f the set for the follow of C already contains every possible symbol that we can add to it. So we are just going to copy that over. And we've indicated that the follow of D is also complete. So we will put that asterisk there. Notice that on this iteration, none of our sets have changed from the prior iteration, so we know that we are done, and we are left with our final set. Now this isn't part of the problem, but it's important to know. Um, one of the main reasons that we calculate first and follow sets is to determine what type of recursive descent parser we can use with them. And you guys probably learned the predictive recursive descent parser, uh, and in order for a predictive recursive descent parser to work for a specific grammar, it has to follow some rules, and those rules are based on the first and follow sets of that grammar. There were two rules, one of which I believe is if you have uh, a first set, of some non-terminal contains epsilon, so I guess we'll say if epsilon is an element in the first of one of your sets. Then the first of A intersected with the follow of A must equal the empty set. And that means that for any of these occurrences here where our first set contains epsilon, then that the first of that set intersected with the first of its follow set, uh, they can't have any of the same symbols. And we can actually see right away here that that isn't the case. If we look at the first of C, it contains C epsilon, and the follow of C contains C dollar sign, etc., which means that the intersection of those two sets is going to equal the set containing C instead of the empty set. So we know right away that um, this gr specific grammar will not work uh, for a recursive descent parser or a predictive recursive descent parser. There is one other rule. which says that if you have a non-terminal that has more than one rule, so say we have the non-terminal A, and A goes to some alpha, and A goes to some beta, then the firsts of alpha intersected with the first of beta also must equal the empty set. And both of these rules must hold for the grammar to work with a predictive recursive descent parser. Moving on to problem three, we're looking at static and dynamic scoping. So we're given this set of code in C syntax and we're asked what the output will be if we run it with static scoping and then what the output would be if we were running it with dynamic scoping. Now dynamic scoping is um, kind of an odd concept to a lot of us because it's not really used in many modern programming languages. However, static scoping you should be very familiar with and we'll do that one first. 
So we, of course, start in the main function. We have i equals 0. Now notice that we aren't declaring i here. We're simply setting our current i to 0. And that means that this i is referring to the global i that we declared outside of the function. So we now know that this i equals 0. And then we call the function foo. Now in static scoping, foo doesn't contain, or a function doesn't look at the variables, the local variables that were declared in the same scope. In static scoping, if you don't pass a local variable into that function, then the function doesn't have access to that variable. So here, when foo says print i, it's printing the global i that it has access to, not a local i that we could have declared before it. So it will print out 0 from the global i, and then we will leave that function and enter this block. Here we do declare a local int i, and we set the value to 42, and then we enter another block. And in, it, in this block, we declare yet another int i, and we set that value to 2. So everywhere inside of this block, when we refer to the value of i, we are referring to this 2. And then we call the function foo. When we call that function, and foo tries to print i, because we didn't pass it this variable, this local variable, the i that it has access to is the one in the global scope. So it will still print 0. And then we'll leave that function. We'll set i equals 100, which, because we are inside of this local scope, is referring to this i. And it changes this value to 100, but that doesn't matter because then we instantly leave that scope. And when we leave that scope, we the value of i is now once again referring to this local i. So we enter another block, and we say i equals i plus 21. So here we are referring to this one, and we will add 21 to 42, which will give us 63. And then we call foo again, because we are still doing static scoping. Foo is going to, again, print out the global i, which is 0. And then, it'll re and then it will return. We then leave this block, and we leave this block. And we once again say i equals i plus 11. Now, even though we've had two local i's declared before this point, they were declared within blocks. And we have now left those blocks. So this i is now once again referring to the global i. So the global i now equals 0 plus 11, which is 11 and we call foo once more. And we see that foo now again prints out the global i, which is 11. And that is the answer for the static scope. Now dynamic scoping is a little less straightforward, but we will give it a shot. Again, we start at the main function, and we set the value of i to 0. Oops. So the global i becomes 0. And then we call foo. And foo is going to print out the value of the global i, which is 0. We'll leave that function and we'll enter a local block here. And we will declare i equal to int i equals 42 as a local variable. We then enter another block and declare another local variable of i equal of int i equals 2. So notice now that because we're doing dynamic scoping, 
we have three possible values of i depending on uh, which block we're in. So we have our global i, which equals 0. And then we have our i equals to 42 from this block. Then we enter another block and we declare another int i equal to 2. So on the stack over here we say i equals 2 and that refers to this block. So when we call foo here, foo instead of pulling from the global i, well this global i actually now has a stack uh, where at the bottom of the stack we have i equals 0 but on the top of the stack we have i equals 2. So when foo prints i it's now referring to this 2. Then we leave that function, we say i equals 100, which changes this value to 100. And then we leave the scope, we leave this block. And when that happens, we deallocate that memory, and this i that we added to this stack gets popped off. We then enter another stack, and here we say that i equals i plus 21. Note again, it doesn't say int i, we aren't declaring a new local variable here. So the i that we are referring to is this one. Uh, it was initialized as 42, so now we are going to say that 42 plus 21 equals 63, and that changes this value to 63. So, we call foo again, and when foo prints i, it prints i from the top of the stack, which is this one. So foo prints out 63. And then our function returns, and we leave this scope, and then we leave this scope, and we say and when we leave uh, that last scope, we are also popping this declaration of i off of the stack. So we say i equals i plus 11. And when we do that, the last, the only value of i on the stack now is i equals 0. It's the global i. So now this becomes 0 plus 11 equals 11. And we call foo, and foo prints off the value of i on the top of the stack, which is 11. And finally, our program returns, and that's it. So we are left with the output using dynamic scoping. Next, we'll move on to my favorite type of problem, and also what I think is the most important problem to take out of this class, which is using pointers. And all for all of the ways that I was taught to learn pointers, box circle diagrams to me were the best. They made everything clear. And uh, to the point that you could solve complicated problems like this um, simply by following a, a step of commands. So for this problem, we're going to end up having to find garbage memory locations uh, or garbage memory at certain locations in the code, as well as dangling references at those locations. And lastly, we'll say all of the memory locations that have been deallocated by location 2. So let's start. Before we reach the main function, we declare a variable a here 
of type pointer to pointer to pointer to int at memory address alpha. So using box circle diagrams, we will write A And for that variable A, we will give it a box. The box represents space in memory. And the memory location of that box, the problem says, is at alpha. And for every box, we will have a circle in it that represents the value stored there. Now, if we have an empty box, in this case, it's going to represent a uh, a null value or, or really just whatever value happens to be at that memory, memory location at that time. So entering the main function, we declare another variable b of type pointer to pointer to int. And that goes at memory location beta. We then enter this block here, uh, represented by these curly braces, and declare another variable c of type pointer to int. Which will go at memory location delta. Next, we're going to set the value of c. We do that by first calling malloc on size of int. And what malloc is going to do is it's going to allocate memory. On the heap. And it says that this memory is at location 1. And malloc returns the value of the memory location that that uh, memory address starts at, or it returns the first memory address for that block. So when we say c equals malloc, here we're going to be setting the value of c to 1, which represents the memory location here. Next, we allocate memory for b as well. So we will create a new block here at memory address 2. And we are going to return that memory address and set it as the value of b. Directly after that, we say that b equals ampersand c. The ampersand represents the address. So this say the value of b equals the address of c. Well, we see that the address of c is delta. So we are going to change the value of b to delta. And then we set the value of a to uh, a memory address by allocating memory. So we'll create another box circle diagram at memory location 3. And we are going to set A to the value of that memory location. Then we call free C. Now calling free C doesn't delete the value C. Uh, it instead deallocates the memory that C, that C points to. So we see here that C points to the memory address 1. So we are going to go up and deallocate the memory at address 1. Next, we set the value of c to null. So 
so that I'll get rid of C there and we'll put null here. And then we reach location 1. So problem 1 asks us to identify the memory locations that are garbage at location 1. And memory is garbage if it's not possible to reach that address in memory from any of your variables. So the best way to visualize this is to go through each of your variables and show the boxes that they point to. So we see that the value of A here is 3. So we know that this points here. And the value of B is delta. And delta and this is B is also a pointer, so we know that B points here. And the value of C is null, so it doesn't point anywhere. Now all we have to do is find the boxes that haven't been deallocated that don't have any arrows pointing to them. In this case, that box will be the one here at memory address 2. So we will write in 2. Then for problem 3, we're asked to find the dangling references at location 1. A dangling reference means that we have a pointer that points to a memory location that has been deallocated, which means that we would have an arrow pointing to a box that was crossed out. You'll notice that that doesn't occur anywhere in our problem so far, so we'll say it's not applicable. And then we'll move on. Just past location 1, and this is important to note, we see a closing bracket here, which means that we are leaving this scope and any variables declared within this local scope are deallocated automatically from memory. In this case, the one variable that we declared is int star c. So we are going to cross that out. And just to make things cleaner, I'm going to remove these arrows for now. So we've left that local scope, and now we're entering a, a new scope. And at this new scope, we are declaring a new local variable of, called x of type uh, int star star. So we will create a box circle diagram for x and it says that that is at memory location kappa. Next we have star a equals malloc. So we have to determine what this star a means. In this case, uh, or in really in any case where you see an asterisk, it means to dereference that variable. When you dereference a variable, you go to the memory location that occurs at the value of that variable. So here we're looking at the variable a, which uh, points to the memory address alpha. So we're going to follow the value of a to the memory location of that value. Because the value of a is 3, we are going to go to memory location 3. And then it says that we allocate uh, a new block of memory at memory address 4. So we'll create a new box circle diagram at address 4. And we are going to set the value at this dereferenced memory location at location 3. Uh, or I'm sorry, we're going to set, yeah, we're going to set the value of this to the value that's returned by malloc. And malloc is going to return the memory address 4. So we can see that A, if we dereference A, it points to memory address 3. 
And if we were to dereference uh, this location, or dereference A twice, we would point here. Next, we are going to set the value of x to the dereferenced value of a. And dereferencing a will give us the value at the memory location pointed to by a. So, if we dereference a, we go to memory location 3. And now we are setting x to the value at this memory location. And the value is 4. So we will set x to 4. Finally, we set the dereferenced value of the dereferenced value of a to the address of a. So in order to handle multiple asterisks, you simply handle them one at a time, going right to left I suppose. So first we will dereference A which is going to take us to the memory location 3 and when we dereference that again it's going to take us to the memory location pointed at by that value which is 4. So now we're looking here and we are setting the value at this memory location to the address of A and we can see up here that the address of A is alpha. So we will set the value at this memory location to alpha. And that indicates that this pointer points here. Finally, we leave the block, that local scope, and when we do that, remember that any local variables declared in that block get deallocated. So now this x variable is deallocated, and we reach location 2. So problem 2 asks us to list the memory locations that are garbage at location 2. So we are looking for any boxes that we have here that uh, do not have any arrows pointing to them. And we can see that, uh, in fact, we do not. Though uh, here we see that B is a pointer, and it contains the value delta. So there should be an arrow from B pointing to that memory location. But uh, the only memory location here uh, that hasn't been crossed out without any arrows is still 2. Then for problem 4, we're asked to find the dangling references at location 2. So these will be boxes that have been crossed out that still have arrows pointing to them. And we can see that the pointer B points to the memory location delta, and the memory location delta has been deallocated. So that is a hanging reference. However, the answer is not B, as you might think. Uh, because the va B has a value. The value of B is delta. Rather, it was when we deallocated B with the asterisk that brought us to the dealloc that brought us to the uh, or I'm sorry, if we dereference B with the asterisk, it brings us to the deallocated memory location delta. So asterisk B is the dangling reference. If you were to write B there, here we already say that B equals delta, right? That's not how you draw delta. Delta. And so this isn't a dangling reference. Delta is just some integer, right? Some memory location. For problem 5, we're asked for all of the memory locations that have been deallocated at location 2. So that will be any box that we've drawn here that has uh, a cross through it. So we have delta, and we have location 1, 
and we have location kappa. And that's it for problem four. Finally, we have the last problem that I'll be covering for you today, which is very fun. It's Hindley-Milner type inference. And while it is fun, it does require a lot of writing, so I'll try not to run out of room. The first thing you want to do when you approach this problem is to number all of these instances. Uh, I do it by using depth first traversal. So we put one there, two there, three, four, five. And those are now all magically numbered. The second thing we want to do before we start is to write down all of the variables that we have here, all of the types, uh, including the function, as well as all of the locations that we've numbered out here. So we will have, actually let's do this up top. We have A, B, C, D, followed by 1, 2, etc. Now that we have those, we're going to want to go through and write down the initial types for all of these locations. And if we don't know the type, then we're going to create a new one. So we'll label A type 1, B type 2. It's an ugly 2. Let's try that again. A little better. C is type 3. D is type 4. And then 1 here, because it's uh, this is a function declaration, 1 here is a function. And it's a function that takes in A, B, C, and D, which we know are of type T1, T2, T3, and T4. So we'll write those in. And that function returns whatever the value of 2 is here. So we could temporarily write 2 out as type 4. I'm sorry, um, as type 5. And then we would know that 1, this function, returns type 5, T5. Okay, now we are going to traverse this tree. Again, I'm going to traverse it using uh, depth first traversal uh, in uh, pre order. And I think that you can actually traverse it other ways, but this is what I know works. So we're going to do that. And with pre order, we will start here at the uh, plus sign at location 2. And if we have the plus operator, it means that we have to add um, the left or the first input and the second input, and they have to be of the same type. Uh, for these examples, they don't have to be numbers or integers. As long as they're the same type, the operator won't throw an error. So we see that at location 15, we're given a string bar. So we now know that location 15 is of type string. And we can infer from that and the rule of the plus operator that both location 3 and location 2 uh, must, must be strings as well. Because as we said, uh, a, the plus operator takes two values of the same type and returns a value of that same type. So 3 is a string, and 2 is a string. Now, 2 already has a type. It's of type T5. So when we change T5 to the type string, 
we have to change all other instances of that type to be string as well. So everywhere else that we see T5, we will change it to string. Continuing our depth first traversal, we are going to go to 3. And 3 is also a uh, plus operator. And we see that the plus operator is going to return a type string already, which means that location 4 and location 10 must also be of type string. Moving on down to 4, we see that location 4 has the array operator, which means that it's going to return uh, the type that we've already determined here, which is a string. And it's a, if, it's, if it's an array operator, then the left-hand side is going to indicate the actual array of a certain type. And the right-hand side is going to indicate the index within that array that we're getting the value. So if 4 returns something of type string, then we know that 5 must be an array of type string, which I'll mark here as AOS. And because we know that arrays take in an integer value as their parameter, we know that location 6 must be an integer. So, here we have location 5, which is D. Um, and actually, because of that, here we've set up here that D is of type 4. So what we should have done is at all the locations that D occurs, we should have written in their type. So here at 5, we had type 4. And now we've changed type 4 to be an array of strings. So at all other locations where T4 occurs, we're going to change them to say array of string. And let's actually go through and do that for all the other variables that this function takes in. So in the places where A occurs, like here at location 7, we're going to write in the type of A, which is T1. B occurs at 8 and 13, and B is of type T2. And C occurs at location 9 and location 11, and C is of type T3. Okay. So, moving on, we know here that at location 6, we are returning an integer, right? We've already marked that down here. But we have to find out how we get that integer. And we see the apply operator, which means that we have a function as the first argument. And all of the arguments that follow, or all of the uh, inputs that follow, are the parameters of that function. That means that at location 7, we are going to change type t1 to be a function that takes in whatever the type is at location 8 and whatever the type is at location 9. So it takes in t2 and t3. And it's going to return whatever the value is at the apply here. So we see here that at location 6, it's an integer. So 
this function returns an integer. Notice that we changed the type of t1 to be the type being a function that takes in t2 and t3 and returns an int. So at all of the places where we have type t1, we need to replace it with that. And instead of writing the whole thing out here, I will scratch this out. I guess we'll write it out. This one, the value is t2, t3, 2, int. All right. So now we have finished this branch. We'll go back up here to the 3 and we will go down the right side. We have an array operator and we know here from location 10 that this array returns a string which means that the first input to the array or the first input to location 10 is an array of type string so we change t3 at location 11 to an array of strings and we know that the second argument for an array operator is an integer for the index so we know that location 12 is of type int and at 11 there because we changed t3 to an array of strings we have to go through and change all other references to T3 to be a reference to an array of strings. Next up, we said that at location 12 we had an array operator, so we know that the left-hand side must be an array of whatever the type is at location 12, whatever 12 returns. So 13, location 13 must be an array of integers. So we will change type T2 to be an array of int and we know that the second argument to the array operator must be an integer but in fact they've already written out just the contents constant zero here so we knew it was an integer already and because in 13 we changed the type t2 to an array of ints we now must go through and change all the references to t2 to be of type array of int. Which means up here for A, we have a function that takes in an array of ints and an array of strings and returns an int. Key two an array of ints for location 1 I'll write this whole thing out now we said that it's a function that takes in t1 and t1 has changed to an array of a function that takes in array of ints array of strings and returns an integer so we'll write that in here
the second argument for this function type was t2, which is now an array of ints. The third parameter is an array of strings. And the fourth parameter is also an array of strings. And that function type returns a value of type string. And that's it. So now we see that this function declaration is declaring a function that takes in another function that takes in an array of strings, or an array of ints and an array of strings and returns an integer. The function also takes in an array of integers, an array of strings, another array of strings, and it returns a string. So now we'll simply go down and fill in the blanks. We saw that the type of A is an array of ints, or a function that takes in an array of ints, an array of strings, and returns an int. Type B takes in an array of ints. Type C is an array of strings. Type D is also an array of strings. And the type that F returns is a string. And that is the end of the problem. As I said at the start of the video, there are two other problems on pass by type name and reference, as well as on lambda calculus, and that will be covered in a future video. I hope that this helped, and I wish you guys the best of luck on your finals.